A lot of people throw around the term lifelong learning. I am a lifelong learner. Okay, fine, but what does that term really mean? I don't mean to be contentious, but a lot of people just say that and it's an empty, meaningless platitude. But there is such a thing called lifelong learning, and you can adopt the principles in ways that benefit your life in every respect. And I mean every respect. I'm not talking about just being smarter. I'm talking about using lifelong learning to build the health of your body and your brain. I'm talking about adopting skills that build your wealth. I'm talking about developing know-how that helps you solve problems faster and indeed avoid problems in the first place whenever possible. So if you're ready to discover the benefits of lifelong learning, different ways to get started with a specific model that will make you a lifelong learner, and some examples that help you think about lifelong learning in ways you've probably never considered before, welcome. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier. You're listening to the Magnetic Memory Method podcast from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. And let's break lifelong learning down into one simple word, because it's not necessarily what you think it is. It is a process, of course, but the word that I would suggest you keep in mind is investment. Lifelong learning is investment. It's an investment of time and resources into at least five key areas. And I can't really see any areas outside of these five key areas, but I'm a lifelong learner, so maybe I'll find some. But really, I think it boils down to investing time and resources into books, courses, coaching and consulting, deliberate practice, and taking on new challenges that push you outside of your comfort zone. Those are the five key areas. To take my own example as a PhD graduate, I was once tasked with reading 500 books and articles for my two field exams. Later, I needed to read even more as part of researching my dissertation, and I had to take courses during those years, and you know, I needed some coaching and consulting from my dissertation supervisor, amongst other professors who sat on my committees to help make sure that I was being as disciplined as possible. Then I needed the deliberate practice of reading those books and translating the knowledge from those books into writing. And then I had to take on new challenges outside my comfort zone, which in that case was getting some of my writing published, which I did. So, even though I don't quite read as much as that anymore, as a true lifelong learner with polymathic interests, and you know, I do really much have in mind being a polymath, being able to develop expertise and skills in multiple areas, I continue doing exactly this in different ways. So music, of course, is a little bit different, and language learning is a little bit different, but it all still comes around to books, courses, coaching and consulting, deliberate practice, taking on new challenges outside of your comfort zone. Now, there's another little bit of nuance here that's really, really important. Because researchers in the field of psychology, for example, they've shown that self-correction is the key to maintaining your expertise. And that's another reason why you have to continue lifelong learning. So years ago on this podcast, I shared with you my rereading strategy, and I gave you a number of reasons why you should be rereading books. And at that time, I didn't know about this research that I'm referring to now, but you can read all about it at MagneticMemoryMethod.com where you can sign up for the free course. And if you search specifically MagneticMemoryMethod.com forward slash lifelong dash learning, you'll have the links to all of the science that I have referred to in today's episode. But at the end of the day, I think that's one of the keys is rereading. And so I was really delighted when I came across this research in psychology that you have to keep reading and taking courses and doing all of these five things that we talked about today in order to self-correct. Because that's ultimately what lifelong learning is about. It's correcting yourself. Now, to go a little bit deeper into this idea of getting coaching and consulting, I think it's quite clear. Read books, take courses, you know, there's not a whole lot of nuance around that. But one of the things that, you know, you should know is that I've written many best-selling books. I've written many successful marketing pieces over the past 12 years. 
But to this day, including yesterday, I have a writing mentor. I meet with him every week. And I had a writing mentor before my current writing mentor. And I've had many mentors over the years. In this year, you know, I've learned new things from my current mentor. And he helps me keep me focused on the fundamentals. So you'd think, well, you've done this for 12 years. What do you, what do you need to continue doing? Well, I need self-correction. It doesn't matter how good you get, right? If you're a lifelong learner, you have to continue learning and you have to continue having help to focus on the fundamentals. Now, if I were to have gone to university as a full-on career and not found the internet as I did and developed MagneticMaryMethod.com, I would still need coaching and consulting basically and that comes in the form of conferences because every year there's all kinds of conferences and people go to it. Now, I'm not a university professor anymore, but part of my own lifelong learning is that I apply from time to time to write scholarly articles and right now I have had a book chapter accepted to a scholarly book on sense and memory and so now I have essentially the coaching and consulting of peer review. So I'm going to, at the end of this month, as I'm recording this, submit my writing and it's going to be basically coached and consulted by other scholars who are then going to say, you know, a little bit less of that, a little bit more of that, and, you know, fix it, basically. They're going to coach and consult me. So this is part of lifelong learning. Now, when it comes to this term, deliberate practice, what does this mean? Well, to keep it simple, it means you keep a schedule and you have a modular routine for implementing what you learn. Now, I've got a whole episode from a few years ago just about deliberate practice, so you can find it in the back catalog if you're interested in more. But just to give you a couple quick examples, if it's language learning, deliberate practice means that you have weekly meetings scheduled in advance to speak with a native speaker. If you don't do that, you're not really deliberately practicing whatever you're learning about that language. If you don't have regularly scheduled reading sessions in that language, well, you're not really learning the language because you need to read, write, speak, and listen to languages. You can't just memorize the stuff. And I know that because sometimes I diddle around with various languages and I just memorize stuff. But I'm not really learning the language because memorizing vocabulary and cool phrases is not learning the language, you know? So if you really want to be a lifelong learner of a language, make sure that you have deliberate practice in each of those areas. For music, you might be thinking, well, where does books come in? Well, I'll tell you where it comes in. I recently ordered a book and it is about music and it has sheet music in it and it has all kinds of, you know, material related to an area of music that I'm super interested in, which has to do with limited hexaphonic transpositions and, <laughs> you know, maximum angularity and these concepts in how you make different kinds of sounds that are unique and original and how do you, how do you not only learn them, but how do you pepper them into your compositions? So you read books and there's a course that helps with this. Course, you can be a little bit more uh, liberal with sometimes because there's a lot of material about this on YouTube as well. But floating around on YouTube is not the same as taking a course from beginning to end. Putting yourself in a position where you deliberately practice the studying of information because you go to an online place where there are no distractions. You log into a portal, you close all the other tabs and you just sit there and you go through it in a structured manner. This is part of what deliberate practice as a learner is. So you know, in music, it may be just taking a course that's only on scales, then taking another one that's only on certain rhythmical principles, taking another one that's only on compositional principles. And you start at the beginning of the course and you go all the way through the end. And when the teacher says to do something, you go and do that thing deliberately. So in one of my musical courses, the teacher said, listen, you can learn all about this limited hexaphonic transposition concept, but until you go and actually write music around it, you really haven't learned it. So go and, you know, write some music around it. Memorize what the current limited hexaphonic transposition is that we're doodling around with and then actually make music about it. And that's exactly what I did because that's what deliberate practice requires. That's what lifelong learning requires. And maybe in this case, I won't coach and consult, but it in itself is taking on a challenge because I just wrapped my mind around what a limited hexaphonic transposition was <laughs> was outside of my comfort zone. But now that, you know, I basically have the concept and I followed the suggestion, 
it, it's just wonderful. And it's, it's expanded not only what I can do in music, but it's expanded how I listen to music. And then I will just repeat the cycle. Just one more example. As a writer, I can tell you this. You know, you need to keep reading. And you need to keep reading writers talking about how that they write, but also reading, you know, what they write and reading a broad spectrum of different kinds of writing so that you can not only maintain your fundamental skill when you yourself sit down to write, but gradually push yourself into unknown areas that you haven't mastered yet. Sometimes that requires going back to relearn the fundamentals of areas that you had mastered before. And that's happening to me with my current memory science project for the Sense and Memory book, where I haven't written in a scholarly manner for quite some time, so I have to go back and relearn those fundamentals, including you know scientific ci citations or scholarly citations. And um, well, it's it, it, it's going to take a little bit of consulting. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll have to ask uh, as part of preparing that. But it also takes the deliberate practice of showing up every day to write in that manner. And also study it a little bit, read more scholarly writing. And so these five principles of investing your time and your resources in books, in courses, in coaching and consulting, in deliberate practice, and in taking on new challenges that are outside of your comfort zone, you can do that inside of what's called a learning cycle, an individual learning cycle. So when we talk about the benefits of lifelong learning, which I want to pause upon just a little bit, keep that in mind. Your personal growth, that idea can be very, very abstract. Oh, the benefit of lifelong learning and following the model that Anthony just shared with me. Well, it sounds really simple. Well, it is simple. It's not necessarily easy, though. But because it's not easy, then it provides many benefits because it's going to stretch you. It's going to promote growth. But you can't be abstract about what that growth is. So I would suggest that you keep a journal of a very specific learning goal that you have and then structure your goal in terms of a learning cycle. Now, I'm not going to get into learning cycles or learning goals today, but if you look at previous episodes of the Magnetic Brain Method podcast, you will find episodes on learning goals and learning cycles. And if you have your learning goals well-structured and your learning cycles well-structured, you're going to see the benefits better and how you grow personally as a lifelong learner is not going to be abstract. But I want to turn now to some specific benefits because if I haven't already sold you on how easy and fun it is to be a lifelong learner by just following those five categories, then you'll be happy to know that one of the number one benefits from being a lifelong learner, if you really are a lifelong learner, not a dabbler, not someone who says it as a platitude, oh, I'm a lifelong learner because I just enjoy learning once in a while here and there and the other place. No, 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 no. We want real, substantial lifelong learning. And here's why. It will help you prevent cognitive decline. So I found some researchers at Harvard's Economic Research Lab. Uh, the group is headed by Plamen Nikolov. And they recently released a study showing that retiring early can lead to cognitive decline, right? They've basically, in the words of Nikolov, he says that you, you there's people who have damaged their, their cognitive skills to the equivalent of having lost three IQ points. Now, you might be thinking, oh, big deal. So, you know, I, I, I lost three IQ points. You know, woe is me, three points. I know it doesn't sound like much, but Nikolov cites a Cambridge University study and just three points can make it harder for you to remember, for example, when you need to take your medication. That, that That's not good, right? So the... Cognitive decline issue is serious. It doesn't take much to knock you off your game. This is all related to principles of prospective memory, procedural memory. And those are two types of memory that not one amongst us can afford to lose or have damaged. So become a lifelong learner. And, you know, language learning is a big one to focus on because bilingualism has been shown to help fortify the brain against issues like Alzheimer's. So if you want a healthy brain, and a healthy mind when you're older, the time to follow the lifelong learning model I've shared today is now. And it works because it's mentally stimulating on multiple fronts. So 
you might be thinking, well, how does the coaching and consulting thing fall into there? Well, have a native speaker. You're consulting with a native speaker as part of your language learning goal. Or if you're doing music, always have a teacher. Always have a teacher. If you're in business, always have a mentor, etc. So th th they will help push you outside of your comfort zone and take on new challenges. And because you're invested in them, they will help make sure you're getting enough deliberate practice. And they will tell you about other books and courses, unless they're, you know, scarcity minded and say, only take my course, uh, which is not the right teacher. But sometimes you have to have that kind of teacher. So that's one major benefit. You'll prevent cognitive decline. I mean, it just doesn't get better than that because you want that lifelong health. And I've given you some science to consider about just how much is at risk if you don't get it. And again, you're welcome to visit magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash lifelong dash learning or just search lifelong learning at magneticmerrymethod.com on the search function and you'll find it and you can follow those scientific links and read them for yourself. And I highly recommend that you do because one of the best projects that you will take on as a lifelong learner is learning about cognitive decline. Spend a couple months on it at least because you can solve a lot of your own problems and have it be a preventative strike against future problems. Now, speaking of problems, another major benefit of being a lifelong learner is problem solving. I mean, I've said for years on this podcast, the more you know, the more you can know. And this is true because information is connective in nature. Even if you're using a memory strategy like chunking, which helps you break complex down, complex topics, I mean, down into very, very small parts, you're actually making the information even more connectable to other pieces of information by breaking it down. But even better is that you're expanding your ability to recognize patterns. And when you can recognize patterns, you can see problems easier. And in many cases, you can solve those problems in advance. Now, sure, you can study critical thinking and problem solving as topics unto themselves. But without embedding those topics in the lifelong model that I've shared, as a lifelong learner, it's unlikely that you're going to get the same pattern recognition that leads to substantial problem solving skills. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of people who study critical thinking, but they couldn't actually apply critical thinking if their life depended on it because they haven't followed the model of deliberate practice as a huge part of it. You can't just read books and courses. Uh, you know, you can't just get someone to talk to about critical thinking. You have to be out there in the field. You have to get sweaty. You have to get dirty. You have to deliberately practice critical thinking in order to have it help you develop the ability to actually solve problems. So that's really, really important. The next thing that is really super beneficial is creativity. I've seen so many students go through the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. They've opened up creatively to what they've learning or what they've been learning and I'll never forget, you know, just some of the wild creative applications that I've seen. So I've seen people watch me recite the alphabet backwards while juggling. And then they've gone out and done it too, but then creatively juggled other things than juggling balls, like juggled books and so forth. Just, just wild creative ideas. Christian Fitzharris, he was on the podcast years ago to talk about his journey learning to be a sommelier. But he also heard me and other people talk about Rhetorica Ad Herenium, this very old memory book, and he created a fun rap song around it called Brain Games. I helped with some of the lyrics, but his creativity was just amazing and explosive, and it comes from applying what has been learned along the journey. And I'm sure he learned more about rhythm and rhyme and all that sort of stuff, but also learned more about the memory techniques that he was talking about in the lyrics of Brain Games. Anyway, it's um, a very fun song. Another example that's been deeply inspirational on me is the novelist David Morell. So he has talked a lot about, well, I guess you would call it immersion learning, and he's trained in everything from defensive driving to crisis negotiation to bring a deeper level of sophistication to his fiction writing. Now, his lifelong learning has not only been profitable, but it led to his character Rambo being one of the most famous movie franchises in all of cinematic history. And I took inspiration from Morel's learning habits when preparing to write my memory detective novel, Flyboy. I completed online courses in forensics, 
I learned all about the utility belts that police officers use and the basics of how to detect crimes, how to investigate them. And, you know, one of the greatest proofs of concept is that an actual detective wound up reading Flyball, Flyboy, and he, maybe I should have called it Flyball. <laughs> that, that sounds more James Bond. Anyway, a real-life detective came to Germany. He had read Flyboy, and he said he was surprised by how accurate the book was, especially because I talk about certain softwares that police use. And, you know, that's high praise indeed, but all it was was following the simple lifelong learning model that we talked about today. I read books, I took courses, I got some consulting from an actual real-life detective, I did some deliberate practice in actually playing games and solving crimes. It was in a game environment, but nonetheless, it was a deliberate practice. And it itself was a new challenge that took me way out of my comfort zone, especially since Flyboy or Flyball, <laughs> I think I need to change it now to Flyball. Um, Flyboy also involved a memory detective game. We'll probably play that game again in the future at some point, but it opened up so much creativity and it's because I followed these principles. And now I'm starting to work on the revision of a new memory detective novel called Vitamin X, and I had to do a ton of research for this one. I think the research is going to show through a little bit less, but I needed it to think through a number of issues, and some of those issues I wound up removing from version four of the book. I've gone through this Vitamin X draft so many times now. I'm on the fifth version. Oh my goodness. But, you know, uh, learning, 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 and making things better and better and better. And one of the things that I had to learn is that the first draft just isn't good enough. So push further, deeper, farther, make it as good as I possibly can, which leads to the next benefit of lifelong learning and being a true learner, tenacity. So I've just given an example of tenacity. But because I'm a lifelong learner with polymathic aspirations to be good in multiple areas, it's not just having the, the grit that it takes to start on version 5 of a novel with over 100,000 words. You know, I, I, one of my favorite activities is to memorize Sanskrit phrases. And this activity involves a lot of mnemonic images. And although the Magnetic Mary Method does not involve creating any of the associations that I use, it does require tenacity. It requires discipline. But the beauty is, is that it builds discipline. So I'm, I'm quite lucky. I got started in my lifelong journey very, very early. So maybe I have deeper pools of tenacity than others might enjoy. But I've seen many people develop stronger reserves of discipline and grit, even if they've spent massive amounts of their lives being lazy or doing little or nothing. Mental training is just a fantastic way to start developing grit, to start having discipline and tenacity. You got to start somewhere and disciplines start to help strengthen themselves over time if you just get started. And this, this has a little bit to do with how that bilingualism, for example, fortifies the brain because as you learn languages, you develop what's called cognitive reserve and cognitive reserve. Basically, it just means like extra gas in the engine. So, it, 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 you know, you got to go and do your own research on this, this topic, but that's how I understand it. So like, for example, people who get dementia and Alzheimer's, if they're bilingual, those conditions just don't affect them nearly as much. So I'm kind of transferring this. And again, you got to kind of like, uh, not necessarily take my word for it, but I, I, and I'm making a bit of a guess and I admit that. But I think that if you did research on this, you would see similar cognitive reserve when you are a lifelong learner, because there's going to be challenges. But if you've got that extra gas in the tank, you're able to just push through those challenges and keep going, keep going, keep going. So that's one benefit. And I've just seen it in writing. Uh, there's so many projects I've had so many problems with, and I just keep coming back at them. And I think it comes from the practice of learning how to write and relearning it constantly. Oh, that author wrote a book about how that he writes or this biography of an author came out about the, you know, the, the, the life of that person, I'm going to read it or I read the introductions of books to just learn more about the tenacity that other writers had and then use those lessons in my own practice. Very, very important. So uh, again, I've speculated a little bit, but I, I think that would bear out in the science, I'm sure. Okay, 
Now, what's another benefit? I think this one is the one that's going to interest a lot of people the most. It certainly interests me, which is career boost, right? So if you're going to be a lifelong learner, you're almost certainly going to enjoy a better career. You know, whether you want to support a company, a big corporation as an employee, or you want to be a freelancer, or you would like to be an entrepreneur yourself and invest in hiring people and developing products and all that kind of stuff, if you can develop the skills of learning following the simple model that we talked about today, you're going to get more out of your investment in the world. So you invest in books and courses and coaching and consulting and de deliberate practice and then pushing yourself outside of your comfort zones. Look, where there's preparation and preparation meets opportunity, there really is no ceiling to what you can do. Uh, there may be, you know, I mean, that's a bit of a cliche where preparation meets opportunity. There is no ceiling. Uh, some people who like John Michael Greer, who has been on the podcast, he might point out that endless permanent growth, eventually it becomes so expensive to keep pushing endless growth that it becomes too expensive to grow. And I think there's a room, there's room in the world for that criticism for sure. And I see the limits of cliches like where preparation meets opportunity, there is no ceiling. But the point is, I think something much more valuable about being a lifelong learner who is deliberately a lifelong learner is that you can rest easy or easier because you have the mental peace that comes with knowing that you're employable in more than one area. You have the ability to sleep at night because you know that you're going to be adaptable to industry changes or you're going to be more adaptable than others. You're going to be competitive. You're going to be ready to move upward when positions open up, if that's what you wish to do, you know? So it is a cliche, but it's not a cliche at the same time. You can't put a price on the ability to be able to move up in this world when opportunity shows itself, or as an entrepreneur, to create opportunity. So with these benefits in mind, there are many more. Let's just talk about some practical steps. I would suggest it this way. Obviously, this comes from my quirky world, my life. I think it'll apply to yours, but there may be other ways to think about it. But I think that there's just some simple and actionable strategies that will help you become a lifelong learner. So let's have a look. One would be envision your future. You know, years ago, mind map expert and co-founder of the World Memory Championship, Tony Buzan, he told me that he wished he had more time to study the greats like Michelangelo, like Da Vinci. But because being realistic is so important, we can't wish and hope for more time. We need to strategize and make use of our time. We need to actually focus and pick and choose, right? And as he told me during dinner one night, the rules will set you free. And when it comes to lifelong learning and envisioning your future, brainstorm about what your ideal future as a learner is. Be selective about what it is that you're going to pursue. If it's three topics, then pursue three. If you feel like you've got 15 things you want to do, pick the top three. You know, I did this with Tony Buzan. I used his approach to mind mapping for my entire business. And by, we, by being willing to create the vision first, I was able to identify the most important things that I needed to learn based on the most important things I knew I needed to focus on. And I was able to identify what I needed to let go of because Tony's right. You, you can't have all the time in the world as, as one, one human in one body. Focus your lens, then build the learning journey. Use learning cycles. Again, there's other podcast episodes that talk about setting learning goals, that talk about the learning journey. There's material on my blog about mind mapping for business, if that's what you want to do, or mind mapping for all kinds of things. I've got lots of posts about mind mapping, but you want to really, really focus on your vision. Envision it and do it with your hands so that you can see when you're doing too much and you can cut out the things that are unlikely or not essential. The next step would be to research the best resources. So I have a program called Read with Momentum. It's for people who want to read faster. We'll probably do a cohort later this year. In Read with Momentum, we focus on how to find the highest quality resources first 
when you're learning something, when you want to read with momentum, you better make sure that you have the best possible materials. Now, there's no doubt about it. This step can be tricky, but it's worth every second that you spend on it, right? Because you are just going to do better when you look for quality. And there are signs of what makes a quality book, what makes a quality course, what makes a quality coach, what things are worth practicing, what areas of stretching your skills into the unknown zones beyond your zone of comfort, etc. Like the, the, those things can all be perhaps not known, but there are indicators. And if you're willing to put in a little bit of time to search for what those indicators are, what those best possible books are, you're going to do much better as you dive into reading them and put them in your learning cycle. So, you know, I don't know what it is you're interested in, but I would suggest that you do that and think about the stages of learning that are going to be involved in the topics that you want to focus on. And just a simple thing is, Look for how universities structure their courses or how colleges have their programs or you know, various specialist schools. What are on their reading lists? What are their practicums? You know, One of the best things that I do on the internet all the time is I just search a particular topic like ontology syllabus. And then I look for the names of the most highly regarded universities. I find out who are the professors that are teaching there. I read the ass assigned readings that they assign to their students. And then I go and read those books, you know, and then I, I just hit the ground running because it is the best resources. I mean, maybe it's not the best of the best of the best, but I don't find the obscure stuff if I don't start somewhere. And so why not start with the assignments given by the most highly regarded professors at the most highly regarded universities. Yes, I know there's a crisis in academia, blah, blah, blah. But the internet is an old place now. And you can also add dates to your search strings and you can find older recommendations. And heaven forbid that you can't use the internet to do that. Go to the library and just find out what is, ask the librarian, what is the textbook on this topic? That textbook will have almost certainly references to the most important books that the people who wrote the textbook needed to read. And then you grab up five or 10 of those books and you read those, you know? So there's a way and you can triangulate and you'll find the best of the best. You'll, you'll be able to save a lot of time by either using the internet in this particular way that I've just suggested or going to a library and finding a librarian who will speak to you and then, you know, finding those resources and just narrowing down what is the best of the best. Now, once you've found that, the next step is to be thorough. So there are some so-called learning experts who say that you should abandon books quickly. Scott Young is one of them. He's been on the podcast. I respect him highly. I just disagree on this point. And I, I certainly respect some of the rationale behind why that he made the point, but I don't get it. And I don't even actually necessarily think that it's something that he does in quite the way that it appears that he's suggesting, because he's often sharing books that are very complicated and a lot of people would abandon very, very quickly because they're not easy to read. I know because I go and <laughs> I read some of them. Uh, the reality is, is that it's not a good idea to abandon books. I don't know why anybody would ever come up with that. What's a better idea is to do what I just said. Find the most likely books to help you get to where you want to go. And if they're hard, if they're boring, stomach it. Set a reading goal, schedule your time, show up, and read. You know, I don't find it necessarily easy myself to get through hard and difficult books. But when push comes to shove, I get out a fresh freedom journal and I start to fill it out. And the freedom journal, I have a whole... Uh, material a blog post on magneticmemorymethod.com that you can search up if you want to know more about what that is. But the Freedom Journal helps me practice what I've come to call Metivier's Razor. And Metivier's Razor, yes, I'm so arrogant that I've named a rule after myself. <laughs> and and I may be so arrogant that I, you know, took upon Occam's Razor and, you know, used that term, uh, thought that I could borrow it. But it's not that I think that I'm great or special or anything like that. But it is an idea that popped in my head one day 
based on science. So it wasn't really my head, <laughs> but it came to me anyway. And I thought this is going to be Metivier's razor. I mean, you only live once. Why not name a razor after yourself? Less than 90 days of study does not deserve the phrase, I tried. Let me repeat that. Less than 90 days of study does not deserve the phrase, I tried. Now you can take it or leave it, but this is a rule I impose upon myself. And it's not just because Tony Buzan said one night over dinner, the rules will set you free. But I think he's right. You just have to figure out what the rules are, but then you have to practice them for a sufficient amount of time for your brain to form neuronal connections. You know, it's there's no denying what we see in the brain scans unless you deny that scans are real. And there certainly are such people. <laughs> there's somebody who has chased me around on, uh, on a forum trying to convince me that the earth is flat and, you know, that I, I, I just haven't answered any of this. Uh, and it's sad that, that, that this is even a matter of debate to this day, but it's there, right? But the denial of science doesn't have to affect you just because it's out there, right? And so we know that a lot of habits will take 90 to 100 days to, to form. And I think sometimes there are books that are going to take 90 days to read, although maybe not, right? But anyway, I myself impose this rule upon myself. Because yes, there are mass market books that are easier to read, and many of those mass market books contain gems. But here's the catch. They're the product of someone else having been through their learning journal journey and having been thorough in their learning journey. And they're reporting to you what happened with the help of editors know what it takes to make a book sell on the mass market. But if you want to reap the benefits of their lifelong journey or part of their lifelong journey to be able to write a very simple book of very complicated topics, you need to be the person who is thorough, right? And here's the best part, because you often get surprised when you're willing to do it. One of the hardest books that I was so terrified of reading, when I finally committed to spending at least 90 days on working out what the heck is going on in Douglas Hofstadter's legendary Gödel Escher Bach, I was pleasantly surprised that it actually only took me about two weeks to read it. But it took an attitude of thoroughness to get me started and keep going. I really thought it was going to take me that long to read it, but it didn't. But it was the attitude and the willingness to apply the so-called Metivier's razor to myself that got me through it. And it was also a daily routine. So, you know, I'm recording this podcast more or less on a schedule. I wrote the material that preceded this podcast more or less on a daily schedule. And I have a daily writing routine. It's been raining a lot this week, so sometimes it messes up my recording schedule because, you know, having rain in your podcast sucks. But I do generally keep a schedule. And when it comes to reading, oh, reading to a schedule has been so important. It can seem like an inconsequential thing, but designing your life around your learning is so pivotal. Spending five to 10 minutes every week to draw out your schedule is amazing what it can do for you. And then stick to your schedule. So much time gets wasted when you don't do something to reduce the interruptions, to avoid randomness in your life. Set and follow patterns. Rest assured. Focused time on scheduling your learning. You will never be bored by what you're learning because there's nothing more boring than being interrupted constantly because you didn't, you know, spend five to 10 minutes to schedule your week to inform other people in your life. I'm going to be reading during this time. Do not interrupt me because then you'll have more excitement knowing that no matter how hard the book is, you have the time to go through it. No matter how hard the course is, you have the space and the focus to get it done. And the other thing I would suggest to get yourself started is to consider groups and platforms, programs, or coaching. You know, not everybody needs necessarily to be in a study group or to have a one-on-one -on -one coach, but I'd suggest that you test that at least one point in your life and see what happens. I spent a few years of my life going through dozens of the great courses. For example, I was in university. Why should I take more courses? But I did. Back then, it was called The Teaching Company. And when I couldn't afford the courses on cassette that they had and that I wanted, 
I did my best to find them at the libraries in Toronto. I rode my bike for long distances to get some of them so I didn't have to wait on the interlibrary loan process. And because I was willing to do that, not only was I relatively fit, but I was able to save a lot of time and learn more because I just didn't wait. I went, rode my bike across town and got it. Three hours versus three weeks, I mean, it's worth it, right? And you can apply this kind of thinking to cohort courses. You know, you may have to wait for me to do Read With Momentum again, but I will, and uh, it'll be worth the wait. Or you can get the replay version immediately. It's up to you. You know, let me know. <laughs> I, I don't know when I'll be doing the next one, but the, the current replay version is there for you. And that's a program. But it's solo, right? You won't be with other people. If you want to be with a live cohort, that has a different feeling. Uh, and and it, it has a logic to it because you'll be there and it's live and you'll ask questions and get answers live and you'll hear other people asking their questions live. Anyway, consider it. But... I sometimes can't, I, I'm in Australia, I can't be at all the courses that I want to attend, so I get the replay versions, and then I follow exactly this principle that I've suggested. I schedule it, I sit down, and I get through it. And yes, I do find, well, I don't, it depends. Sometimes I don't mind going through replays, other times I really do just have to, you know, be a little bit more brutal on myself. The rules will set you free. I bring back that voice of Tony Bizant telling me the rules will set you free. And one of the rules is, is if you want to learn something, be thorough. <laughs> so I find the time I schedule it, I sit down, I take notes, and I learn whether I can be there or not. Okay, coaching. It's one of my personal favorite learning strategies. I find group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching invaluable. I sometimes hire consultants or network with specialists to learn more about fields that I'm studying. Last week, I had three consulting sessions. Such a blessing. And part of it comes down to problem solving also because I'm trying to figure out all the problems that I would face in advance. And I have widened my options and seen into many dark areas that I never thought of. So invaluable. And I'll take that learning with me for the rest of my life. You just, oh, it's amazing what, what can happen when you spend an hour or two with someone who's truly an expert in their field. You know, you just, you can't think of it all yourself. And so I triangulate and I may have more consultants on this particular thing that I'm researching, but at least three minimum, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll continue, and I am well into 30 days, but I'll continue for 90 days because Metivier's razor says anything less than 90 days of study just doesn't count it. Uh, it doesn't cut it, but uh, it, won't, it won't count up either. It will, won't stack up. But in this particular thing, which I'm being a little bit mysterious about because I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, but in this thing, it is part of my lifelong learning that I'm studying, and I've read books on it. I there's not really a course related specifically to this thing, but I'm taking courses that are as closely related as possible, working with coaches and consultants, three minimum, as I've done. There is some deliberate practice involved, and it is definitely outside of my comfort zone, and I'm still not sure that I'm going to do it. But one of the things that I found is that one of the consultants that I talked to, he told me about a weekly meeting of people who specialize in exactly in what this idea that I want to learn about is, and I've been invited and I'm going to go. Uh, it's really early in the morning, but I'm going to go. And the best of the best are in this group. So again, I'm being a bit mysterious. But um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what it has to do with. It has to do with magic. <laughs> and it's so much fun. The point is, is it doesn't matter what it is. I want you to understand the principle. I have helped myself in my lifelong learning about an idea that I would really like to see happen in the world. It already is happening in the world, but I would like to be part of it. And so I have found group coaching. I didn't even know it existed, and I never would have known that it existed if I hadn't gotten a one-on-one -on -one coaching slash consulting session with one of the best in the business. Send an email, how much does it cost? Told me what it cost, bang. And I did it with three individual people. And then I, I just had my entire world opened up. And now I, I'm allowed, with no cost actually, to come to these weekly meetings to talk about this particular idea. And it is a great blessing to be able to do so. I think it was Michael Hyatt who said that we all have more resources than we imagine within, uh, within our grasp, within arm's reach. So make no mistake, this is not an extravagance. Other people's knowledge is an asset and you can boost your progress by tapping into their knowledge. All right, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about overcoming barriers to lifelong learning. Uh, 
These days, it's all the rage to say that there's no such thing as free will. I'm very familiar with this because I wrote a whole chapter about free will in my book, The Victorious Mind. And I based that on research that came from the fruits of my own lifelong learning about philosophy, about uh, which free will is a major area. Robert Sapolsky's recent book, Determined, is a recent entry in the field. And as a lifelong learner, I read it. And he's really put his foot down on the notion that free will isn't real. It doesn't exist. But if that's right, how on earth can you get yourself to change and become a lifelong learner that follows the model we've talked about today if you aren't already doing it? It's actually pretty easy. You're listening to the podcast right now because something in you has compelled you to either search for information about how to become a lifelong learner or you followed a link or somehow it came across your radar but you followed an impulse. Well, try to see if you can get yourself to lean into that original impulse that got you interested to the point that you're still listening to me right now. Explore that energy. Maybe use some of the self-inquiry techniques I teach in The Victorious Mind to learn more about what it is in your mind that you clearly already have in order to go deeper. Find the next level. Now, I'm today helping you find what those other things are. Oh, I got a podcast about learning cycles. I've got a podcast about learning goals. If you have resistance to go and follow up with those resources, instead of pushing those resources or instead of pushing the the resistance away, get curious about the resistance. Is it that you worry that it'll be boring to learn about learning cycles and writing proper learning goals? Is that your boredom? Or did you just hear from some other expert, some accelerated learning guru, that it's okay to abandon books or to you know, flee from courses that you've studied, right? I don't know what the answer is, but find the truth lurking behind the question. Then search out a better truth and then follow the recommendations attached to that if you can get yourself to do it. And if you can't, ask why, ask why, ask why, you know? I, I, I just mentioned this project with magic and again and again and again I come up with resistances and I just keep asking why is it a is it a fear that I'll fail uh, that I'll fail is it a, a fear of some sort of scarcity that I won't have enough time is it this is it that and then that keeps me coming back and back and back because you need to keep coming back at it and again I mean I'm just doing the research and I'm applying Metivier's razor 90 days or less I don't get to say, that I have tried, right? And, and that's kind of brutal. This is tough love. But the thing is, sometimes you have to compel yourself and have skin in the game. So my current coach, I signed up with him and the one previous to him and the one previous to him. I did it not because there is such a thing as free will, but because I know how to engineer my absence of free will. Because left to quote-unquote myself, I know I would not work on the fundamentals that I know need to be in place in order to succeed. But by investing in some help, I've encouraged my mind to want a return on the investment. And this investment strategy has propelled my attention in so many ways that just wouldn't be possible otherwise without skin in the game. So it's really, really important. And maybe it's not for you, but it's an option for you to consider and explore. And if it's not for you, I would just suggest, why? Why not you? I don't know if you know Rick Beato. He's a major musical educator on YouTube. And he had a video years and years ago. He was talking about how he succeeded. Like his channel just totally blew up. And he was talking about all the reasons why it blew up. And then he just said, you know, if you are working on something and you, you would like similar success, just ask, why not you? Why not you? Why couldn't you be that person who's successful in that realm? Yeah, so, you know, just keep asking the question if you can get yourself to ask the question. I know it's complicated because sometimes we find ourselves stuck and we're like, well, I really want this, but I can't get myself to do it. So just see if you can lean into that original impulse that brought you into the idea in the first place. This is where free will is fascinating because really it's just circumstance and chance and luck and all this sort of stuff that you even know that certain ideas exist in the first place. And then, you know, lean into that magic and then ask, why, why not you? 
Why not you? And you may find reasons that let you get off the hook. Yeah, well, maybe I shouldn't. But you might find more reasons that help propel you and keep you moving forward. And I hope some of what I'm doing will help you in that way. And I don't know if it will or not, but read books, take courses, get coaching and consultant consulting, practice deliberate practice properly. I've got a whole podcast on deliberate practice for you. And take on new challenges that push you outside of your comfort zone. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So let me give you some examples other than myself. I mentioned Christian Fitzharris and his rap song Brain Games. He's been an actor. He's been a magician himself. I've seen him do some amazing magic on YouTube. I think he's a better magician than I am, quite frankly. He's done all kinds of things, and he's working towards becoming a sommelier. One of the hardest things in the world is to become a sommelier. If you don't know that word, it means like a wine expert. Uh, you know, it's like you have to know so much stuff about wine and different soil conditions and rain and areas by name and... I don't even know the half of it. I just know that I've helped people do it. In any case, there's him. My testimonials page is filled with successful stories like this or stories of people taking on learning different things, learning acting, learning magic, learning music, learning sommelier arts, so forth. I think of Jeannie Ko. She, she said that, you know, she wanted to learn the Bible in one of the original languages and... She said it was helpful to not only get the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass, but have e the, the access to my coaching, which is something you can only get if you're in the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. She said that I was attentive and wise and an effective guide and teacher. And, uh, you know, you can read that for yourself on the testimonials page at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash testimonials. She memorized a bunch of scripture with so much greater ease and... Her story is reflected also in Matt Barclay's experience. You can hear Matt on a previous episode of the podcast. He used memory techniques not only to, wow, I mean, his demonstration of reciting a psalm from memory is amazing and inspiring, but he did it while he was recovering from cognitive issues that came from having cardiac arrest. So it helped heal his brain. I mean, I, I, when, I, when I said at the beginning of this episode that it is, this is not just about being smarter, he was able to actually exercise his mind and recover some of the memory that he lost because of this cardiac arrest. Oh, knock on wood, if I ever have such issues, I hope that I am smart enough to remember my career here as a, a teacher of memory techniques for the past 12 years now and um, make sure that I use use the techniques because there's, there's lots of stories of people who have recovered from traumatic brain injury and the like. And mnemonics has helped them. Maybe they didn't have a full recovery, but some recovery is better than no recovery. Anyway, I think also of a guy named David Matthew, and he's one of several lawyers over the years I've helped pass the bar. But why I think of David Matthew in particular is he also learned Spanish while he was preparing to pass the bar and passed a number of professional certifications. So, as I'm sure you can imagine, being a bilingual lawyer is definitely going to increase your value on the market. Being a bilingual person in any area is going to increase your value on the market. It's going to make you more competitive. So, why not get started immediately? Because th learning the first language is going to be so helpful for learning the next language after that, but it'll also give you skills in learning anything complicated because it's going to build up your grit, your tenacity, your discipline. Last example that I'll give today is James Gerwing. He would email me for many years with updates after he completed the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. And it would usually be something like this. Oh, well, I just won the, the competition in my province here in Canada. Thought, I thought you'd like to know. And then the, the, the last message before I had him on the podcast, which you can listen to, uh, he said, about five years ago, I began taking your online course and then I went into some memory competitions. I am the four-time current undefeated and record holder of the Alberta Memory Championship. Even better, I just won the 2019 Canadian Memory Championship and the first ever Pan Provincial Championship. I've been banging things into the void of my memory for decades. You have revived and revived in me the concept where there is a will, there is a way. Since signing up for the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass, I've taken a Latin course at the University of Alberta and scored above 90%, which is not common territory for me. Thank you for your input. I love how he says that. Thank you for your input. Because that's all it was. That's, that's the free will question, right? If you're lucky enough to bump into the person who inspires you to take action, 
That's what I did. I gave you some input, and then you took it from there. And Latin is not an easy language. And, you know, he's a lifelong learner who just followed these core principles we've talked about today. And he easily managed to become a national memory champion and score highly in this language. He's a true Renaissance man, you know? That's amazing. And you could be a Renaissance person yourself. So what about you? Do you have big goals? If you haven't already been to magneticmerrymethod.com to at least get started with my free memory improvement course, go there. You can sign up for it or you can just scroll to the bottom and find information about just joining the Magnetic Merry Method Masterclass. Either way, you know, it's just a course and it's going to be my input that can help propel you in your lifelong journey as a learner. But it has that beautiful effect of being the one course that helps you remember more of every other course you take. The one course that helps you remember more of every book that you will ever read. And beyond that, just think about what you're doing. Reflective thinking is the ultimate open secret that will help open even more doors to learning as much as possible across the span of your life. Ask why, ask why, ask why. Why am I compelled to do this? Why am I not compelled to do this? And the more you improve your memory, the better your journey through this life will be because you're going to expand your mind's ability to deal with multiple details right here and now. So as you are reflective and you are thinking, why, 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 why am I resistant? Why am I so energetic about this? The more improved your memory is, the more processing power you have, the richer and more detailed and more nuanced and resonant the answers are going to be. I don't know what they will be, but I have every reason to believe they will be magnetic. So thank you again for joining me for this episode of the Magnetic Mary Method Podcast. Come visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com. And until we have a chance to speak again, be a lifelong learner and keep yourself magnetic. I define, establish, exercise, and practice. Externalize spatial maps as I attack the path of mature learner. Bottle burner, max memory reserve in earnest. I'm a furnace, an anomaly. Sibling, Sibling of Simonides known to reduce cognitive load. And oh, how I rotate, juggling space, making a case for brain games. So digital amnesia leaves you. Digital dementia is censured. Did y'all tag uranium on your mind wall? Review, recall, we will evolve. Brain games, synapses flashing, mind palace crashing with brain games. Info encoded, mental high roller. Brain games, synapses flashing, mind palace crashing with the brain games. Info encoded, mental high roller. This is not a game you can afford to lose. <gasps> Why? Brain games, don't need an app for that I just attack with the path of a lab rat I mean scientist, I'm an annihilist Finalist, illuminist, numinous Doing this, proving this, who is this scholar? Dopamine fiend, clean sheen like the Pleiades Enemies, ill at ease, killing with abilities Rolling with affinity, rolling with McKinney Brain games, healthy snacks Build a palace, pick some facts Learn to balance while you rap Unleash talents, don't look back Brain games, synapses flashing Mind palace crashing with the brain games Info encoded, mental high roll Brain game, synapses flashing, my palace crashing with the brain game. Info encoded, mental high roller. <laughs>